Welcome into the Roaring Repeater podcast here on 7220sports.com. I'm your host, Cody Tucker, joined in studio, as always, by Jared Newland. At this time last week, Jared, um, I was in my car flying over to Laramie because about an hour prior got a message that uh, there would be a press conference held in Laramie. Also saw a tweet, kind of a cryptic tweet, because it wasn't outlandish at all saying, you know, happy trails to you or anything. It was very subtle. And uh, then the the email started coming. Craig Bull, after 10 years at the University of Wyoming, retiring, riding off into the sunset, one final rodeo for him and Laramie. Uh, Of course, Cowboys playing in the uh, Arizona Bowl in Tucson December 30th. And in true Wyoming fashion, five minutes later, an email comes out. Jay Savell named the 33rd head coach in Wyoming football history. Uh, I'm sure they offered Jared to give Bowl his day in the sun. That's just not his style, and he's proud of Jay Savell. A la Gerald Mattinson, same way he retires. They name Heather Rizell five minutes later. And it's worked out well as far as how the press conferences roll. Yeah. It's not like they're bringing somebody in from the outside that might anger a coach, you know, mm-hmm. by why'd you hire that guy? Not, not within type of a deal. Yeah. So I think it worked out well. And, and plus for you guys to be there Yeah. and for, you know, I mean, Wyoming's a small place. We all know that. And there's only so many people that are covering the pokes. Yeah. So it works out well. Yeah. I, I guess first question I have for you, Jared, just initial thoughts. I mean, we have been asking, the media has been asking Craig Bull about his impend, you know, pending retirement. He's 65 years old. Um, He's done this an awful long time, 21 years as a head coach, long-time assistant, assistant, more than four decades in this game. What were your initial thoughts when you heard the news? Not shocked because you and I actually talked about it like two weeks previous mm-hmm. and even brought up, you know, what if they just move Jay Sovell or Tim Polisek into that role? You you do what you do on one side of the ball and then you let the other guy go do what they do on the other side of the ball. Yeah. So we didn't know who it would be. We didn't think Tim was probably in the position for that. Um, and really, I guess we did, probably didn't know Jay would be in the position for that, but obviously Tim Bur- or Tom Berman did do his due diligence. Mm-hmm. Um, he had some other people in mind, but then, then after he gave Jay a few days to you know put together a plan on what he would do as head coach, then he was he was sold on it. Yeah. You know, I think you and I have talked about it. I, I know certainly my colleagues up in the press box, we've talked about it. Who – if they hired from within, who on this staff would be ready to step up? Uh, Shannon Moore is the only coach on this staff currently that has been a head coach at any spot. And that was what, the Casper Cavalry, Wyoming Cavalry, whatever they were called, the indoor league Which team up in Casper? Really count. <laughs> yeah, it, that's your only head coach. So we would often think to ourselves, how could they promote from within? So really the question was more, do you go with a hotshot FBS coordinator or do you go the FCS route again and try and find a head coach making his way up? Uh, obviously, we hear the name Brent Vegan a lot. Um, low energy. Uh, not sad that he's not the head coach at all, uh, despite what he's doing in Bozeman being you know so amazing up there. Um, they did lose last weekend. Yeah, darn it. Um, do feel for Sean Chambers. I love that he, he resurrected his career up there. And I know a lot of players have a lot of respect for Brent Vegan. And I don't disrespect him. I just... That's low energy, man. I, I wasn't interested in that. Jay Savell, to me, was the most likely guy um, if you had to pick. So I wondered if they would do that. And I asked Berman at the press conference, like, does this worry you at all that he doesn't have any head coaching experience? And to Tom's credit, he said, yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. But it made the most sense, didn't it? It did. And you look at continuity. It worked at North Dakota State. They hired within. That guy is now the head coach at Kansas State. Yeah. Another assistant is the head coach who is now leaving to go to USC as the D coordinator, which is kind of ironic, but I'm sure he's quadrupling his salary or more, even right. more just to be a D coordinator. Um, so it, it worked under in Craig's um, system, put it that mm-hmm. way. Um, so I'm anxious to see if it will continue to work. Um, I do like Jay. Um, I, I don't know him personally. But I do like what I hear from him. Yeah. I like how he calls the defense on game days. I'll yes. tell you that. Yeah. And I like how he prepares and he t- how he tells you things on what to look for. Yeah. You know, this is what they're preparing for. This is what to look for type of a deal. And he'll he'll be frank with you too. No doubt. If he doesn't think they're prepared, 
No he'll doubt. say, hey, that was on me. I didn't prepare these guys. Yeah. Or he was like, we took a couple of chances here. Let's see what happened. Right. You know, all those kind of things. I can't sit here just like you and tell you how this is going to go. Um, but what I can tell you is selfishly, I love Jay Savell. Uh, he's, like you said, he's been very open and honest with me. I approached him as, hey, you know, I want to be the best sports writer I can be. And if you ever see anywhere where I'm slipping up or I have just totally missed the point or missed the ball on something, please let me know. Luckily for me, I haven't missed the mark completely, but he will let me know um, how he's feeling about stuff and if he thinks my stuff's accurate. Or And half the time, to be honest with you, Jared, it's, you know, when you do a goofy story like grading, grading out positions, you know, I would grade the secondary a C or a B last year, for instance, and he'd go, that's way too high. <laughs> way too high. Like, what game are you watching? <laughs> so, brutally honest, like you said. So, I love it. He wears his heart on his sleeve. I thought it was uh, um, really touching. You know, he got really emotional during his press conference talking about his daughters. He comes from a divorced family. And uh, it was just like, they said, it's okay, Dad. Go go follow your dream. Is he now the most eligible bachelor in yes, the state of Wyoming? 100%. <laughs> well, and he's damn handsome, isn't he? Another short, bald guy. Uh, <laughs> no, I love Jay Savell. But like I said, I don't know if this will work. And to be honest with you, Jared, I hate even putting this out into the atmosphere, but I think I told you this is the last two defensive coach hirings from within that I've thought about. Fritz Shermer, which Fritz obviously had to deal with the Black 14 disaster left over by Eaton, but Vic Koning most recently loved Vic as a defensive coordinator. I remember his last year under Dimmel. He headbutted a player that had his helmet on before the game because he was so jacked up and had blood running down his forehead. So when they hired him, I thought, awesome. Is that really smart? No, <laughs> it's not. And um, and Fritz turned out to be probably one of the best defensive coordinators sure. the NFL ever had. Sure, yeah, no doubt. And and he didn't have a fair shake in Laramie. But, I mean, the records are what the records are. And um, it's across the board, across the country. There are just some assistants that aren't meant to be head coaches. They're meant to be coordinators. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Jay, uh, Bourbon brought this up a lot. Jay has coached under Lou Holtz and Jerry Kill. Um, what Jerry Kill's doing right now in Las Cruces is nothing short of a miracle. Um, and they're playing really, I actually watched that game against Liberty. They were going up and down the field with ease. They are a really good team. So any, you know, he played at Mount, uh, Union, uh, Mount Union, uh, what division three powerhouse, uh, that's, numerous national championships. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy has a pedigree, no doubt about it, but what Berman mentioned that is so overlooked, in my opinion, and maybe something, a place where Bull fell short, which might have led to this transition in the first place, in my opinion, Jared. Jay's a people person. He loves these players. I just pinned a story, actually, about Jordan Bertinoli, and he literally said a couple times in my interview, I love him. I love him. You know, And I have heard Bull say the same. But um, and we heard of the reaction of Chad Muma and Andrew Winger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what they said about Jay when they heard the news. Um, and Winger didn't even play for him. Yeah, and yeah. and then Logan Wilson also tweeted out some things, you know, mm -hmm. after the hire and and the retirement of Bowl and all that kind of stuff. So I think you when you hear that, especially from former players and the current players. I mean, it would have been great to have a video of what their reaction really was in the locker room. But at the same time, I also respect the fact that they wanted it to be secret instead of just trying to blow up um, social media for clicks. Yeah, I, I'm i with you, but I, I do wish they would have shared it. Um, I know Bull has talked about giving out scholarships. I mean, he's given out damn near 50 scholarships to walk-ons. And we've talked to him about, man, why not do these videos? These videos are incredible. And he's just like, ah, oh, it's phony. It's all phony. And I'm like, phony, that is real deal emotion, man. That's the good well, stuff. Maybe Jay will moving forward. Who knows? Yeah, he might. And, and I asked Jay, too, off the record. Uh, Kevin McKinney actually approached me and said, nobody asked the most important question of all. Are they going to put names on the back of these jerseys now or what? <laughs> and I asked uh, I asked him off the record and saw Bill said, no comment. He probably didn't want to say it in front of Craig. Wait till Craig leaves and then we'll we'll uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, and I just hope he doesn't change up the, the scheme and yeah. the design of the uniforms, though, because I really do like where they're at with the uniform. Yeah. Other than maybe on the road, white on white. I like brown pants, too. Big fan of those 90s brown pants. I'm even a big fan of the 93 all brown uniform in general. Oh, yeah, they got their ass kicked in those <laughs> <laughs> against the sheep. You know what? Honestly, I'm a... I, 
I, I can go either way. I, I liked what Christensen did aside from the camo. The camo was a complete disaster. Other than that, I, I didn't mind it. And I like Nike a lot. So, and I guess they have a lot of sway. Yeah, and they're not <laughs> moving away from Adidas because they're the only ones that really wanted to do an all department deal. So that they'll be they'll be staying with Adidas. Yeah. So. Um, back to Craig Bull a little bit. Uh, what do you what do you think his legacy is going to be, Jared? Um, longest tenured head coach in Wyoming football history. Check. Um, got this got this uh, program back on stable footing. Check for sure. Um, consistency, consistency. Um, but is it unfair to? Because some people are going to say he never won a title. He was overpaid. Never won a title. Uh, is that fair? S- to a degree, I would say it is. Um, he's sixty and sixty, so we'll see if he's one game above five hundred or one game below five hundred when he leaves. Which honestly, I know pe- the haters want to. Dock on it, but but take out those first yes, two years. Yes, you have to six and eighteen. Right, was his record the I first believe, two yeah, years? Six wins for yeah. sure. Yeah. So if you take those out, he's obviously he would be you know doing okay. I and mean, then you two would, COVID wins. Yeah, you would look on that. You would look on the overall record a lot differently. Yeah, but of course we can't. Yeah. Uh, but he did get to the championship game once, and Wyoming hosted that game. What a, I mean, that's a season that a lot of us probably will never forget. Absolutely. Um, yes, it could have ended better <laughs> yeah. in, in as as champions and um, beating BYU in the bowl game. Yeah. But Josh Allen is Josh Allen. He's he, he's a gunslinger. We yeah. know that, and he, yeah. that's the way he played the game. And and we he, lived and died with yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but you look at the amount of NFL talent that he put out in ten years. And then maybe there's one or two guys off of this team that are going to add to his, you know, um, list as well. Uh, Wyoming hasn't had that ever. No, that many NFL guys at the same time playing, let alone not. I mean, starting in the NFL, let alone playing in the NFL. Used to maybe scour the box scores here and there. Hey, did he get in at all? Did he get a special teams tackle? Mm -hmm. It's not about special teams anymore. For years, it was Malcolm Floyd, right? Yeah, I mean, it is. And then you know. Wendling and Przinsky. Hey, yep. did they get a tackle? Did they, you know, all that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Now these guys are starting, and and you see Wyoming jerseys in NFL stadiums, right? But the maddening part of that, Jared, on the flip side, glass half empty, as Craig Bull would say, how do you not win a Mountain West championship with all that talent? And that's a question I've asked him, and he wasn't very happy to get that question because I don't even think he had the answer. It's it's been re- he develops guys he made no bones about that and he did we saw it with our own eyes year in and year out. But are they developed too late? You know, they're you only have a small window to kick ass in college football and they're developed right into the NFL and and a Logan Wilson's a perfect example. Well, of that. the biggest knock in my mind that I could say on Craig Bowl is that he never <laughs> adapted to who he had on the roster. It was his way or the highway. Yo. The players needed to adapt to his system, and he wasn't going to go the other way. And you have to Yo. in today's age, and actually any age, Yo. because you have to pare down that playbook. Who cares if it's an NFL playbook? Yeah, not me. Pare it down Yo. to the talent you have and run the plays that can work for who you have on that team. I'll, I'll never forget one of his last press conferences when I wrote the column about how Wyoming and Craig Bull are at a crossroads because they were, because his last year of his contract is coming up. You're not going to go into this year a lame duck coach. It's just not going to happen. There has to be a plan. But when he stood behind the podium and clapped his hands and was like, we're not basically mocked offenses that are hurry up and, and, and spread them out and how they're so simplistic, one word, clap your hands, throw the ball. The whole goal, I'm just sitting there thinking, man, the whole goal is to play fast and loose and get the ball in your explosive guy's hands like Jay Savell talks about. And you go back to that Nevada game. Now, Grant, I know Nevada's a 2-10 and team. Yeah. But they were playing a two-minute offense a lot of that game. They weren't huddling, and they were letting Peasley do checkdowns, see what the defense was giving him, and then he went with it. And I, I believe you're probably going to see that in the bowl game as well. Um, obviously with a, a month to prepare, you're probably going to see some trick plays mm-hmm. and things like that as well. Cause you always do. And especially these lower tier bowls, but 
that's probably not what the offense is going to look like under Jay and if Tim's still around. But you know, you don't know. Hopefully, I like what that offense was against Nevada. Yeah. Just oh, because it was – Yeah. Just yeah. because it was – it's not – you're not waiting until two on the play clock to snap the ball. Yeah. You're just kind of – you're in a – Flow. Flow, yeah. Yeah. It never looked better. And, and you've seen that – Two minute offense several times this year at the end of the half where he used to kneel down on balls. Yeah. This year he was actually moving the ball and trying to score score points. Well, the the drive before halftime against UNLV is a perfect example. Yep. Was sat up there in the press box at Allegiant Stadium going, watch them milk this last Here we go again. 45 or whatever off the clock. Here we go. And they moved right down the field. And if it wasn't for a really Poorly thrown ball. Uh, they might be. They might win that game, yep. and then we might be talking about a totally different scenario. But I, I got to admit, uh, when I got that email saying Craig was done, um, I didn't get emotional in the sense of like crying or anything. But it was kind of emotional. Um, he's the only coach I've known since I've covered the Wyoming Cowboys. Um, we have a healthy respect for each other. I think. Uh, he took his shots at you, but yeah. he always apologized. He did. Yeah, yeah. and I, I respect the hell yep. out of Craig Bull. Um, he didn't intimidate me whatsoever. Uh, you know, he, he's an intimidating figure, really, but he didn't – we just had that respect. It's kind of hard to explain. And you can tell Tom Berman felt the same way about the, the mutual respect. Yeah. Because he even said, he goes, I've gone to him for advice off, you know, yeah. out of the department. Personally. And I'm sure that's stuff that Tom's had – go on in his personal life the last three, four, five years as well. Yeah. And I'm sure because Craig's been through it as well. Yeah, no question. So, and Jay's been through it, so yeah. They, yeah, that's kind of been a good mix. And I th- I think there's several people on that campus that have good, close friendships with Craig Bowl that you and I and some of the other people don't have. Yeah. Uh, but I know that he, like Linder actually talked about it too. He said, I appreciate the fact that he had a, his door was always open to me. Yep. I'd go in there and a five, 10 minute meeting might turn into a 30 to 45 to an hour meeting. No doubt. So he's a, he's a great human being in so many ways. Really liked Craig bowl. Um, I think he did. He was all about the right things and he did the right things. If there's a huge knock on him to me, it's what you've already talked about, especially on the offensive side of the ball. You've just got, you have to adapt and you have to, bend your way of thinking and because this worked at North Dakota State doesn't mean it's going to work here. And if it's your philosophy to run the ball 60-40, yeah. and to grind it out, that's great. But let the offensive staff do their job, too. Yeah. yeah. You still have to move the chains. <laughs> yeah, and when it came to throwing the football under his tenure when they needed to, it rarely happened. Uh aside from Josh Allen, uh it just rarely happened and that's just the that's just how it is, man. That's what happened. I probably shouldn't say this on the air without looking it up, but you could probably look at certain five-year periods in Wyoming history and put it against Craig's 10 years history on passing versus rushing yards. Oh, yeah. And just to see what it – Yeah, I mean, think, <sighs> think about Tiller's last five years. Or, yeah. Yeah, no question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think – we might be putting too much into this legacy thing. I think he has a great legacy. Um, I really do. I think he's going to be remembered fondly. He, he's Wyoming. <laughs> he is. I mean, as maddening as it got, sometimes he was. He's tough as nails. He doesn't put up with any BS. And and that's what we. That's Wyoming. And you guys asked him straight up. Well, so what are you going to do? Are you going to ride off in the sunset? And he goes, Well, you know, we have horses. We have this. Well, he knew what was in the works. What yeah. he's going to do. Oh, yeah. He's most likely going to be moving to Texas to be the AFCA president. Yeah, no doubt. And and he got on his soapbox there during his press conference. And, and I wonder 20 years from now if he's going to be like, man, I shouldn't have wasted that press conference doing that. I think he did it to avoid getting more emotional. He also uh, only accepted a couple of questions, uh, fielded a couple of questions he didn't want. He was very, very emotional. And and people some people were really shocked to see that. I'm not shocked at all. He's he's teared up and broke down not broke down, but he's teared up uh a handful of times since I've covered him. He he really cares and he really cared and he's so proud of this uh what he's done here and he's proud of his baby and and, and like Kevin McKinney said, we wouldn't even be sitting in that building if it wasn't for Craig Bull likely. 
I'm oh. telling you, all as I was told, those first couple of years he was here, he pre- he spent more time in the foundation. Yeah. Than he did in the football facility. Yeah. He and the president of the foundation, Ben Blaylock, became very tight very quickly. Yeah. On what his vision was and what they needed. Good for him, yep. and it worked. Um, and now, obviously, the West Stands are completely gone. The whole lower section's completely gone. And does that happen without Craig Bull? Do people pull and in, reach into their wallet if, uh, if for a guy like Dave Christensen uh, or a guy like Craig Bull? Uh, you know, and the one thing I will say that Jay Savell said during his press conference that kind of was like, "Oh, Jay," he said, "Man, I'm just a football coach. I'm not a PR guy." Unfortunately, you have to be. And he already talked, he joked about like, I don't know how I'm going to be like Craig and go to the Senate and, or, you know, go to the state legislators. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, just bring the bronze boot and smile. Yep. Um, But that's stuff you have to do. You have to hobnob. And Joe Glenn was obviously the best at it. I think Craig Bull kind of mastered it. He wasn't over the top like, like Joe Glenn, but he'd also shake every hand. Craig's was in a business manner. Yes. Where Joe's was in a rah, rah yeah. slash business manner. But I loved it. Oh, it was awesome. I love Joe Glenn. Absolutely love him. Uh, I'm I'm gonna miss Craig Bull. I really am. Um, I'm not gonna miss him, kind of picking on you guys during press conferences. Yeah, and kind of being an ass at times. Yeah, I mean I think that's a fair word. Sure, because he was. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I'll miss his stoic, you know, <laughs> <laughs> poses on the sidelines. And, yeah, you know stuff like that. And but. It's time to move on. I mean, he he's had a great football career. I mean, he's been in it for what four decades. Yeah. Uh, so so good for him, and enjoy these last you know years of his you know so called professional life at the AFCA, and then after that, it's full retirement. He's going to be great at the AFCA. Well, and um, you, I guess hindsight twenty twenty, you could probably see it coming. Oh, totally. Yeah. He was the president. Yeah. And now he's actually going to be the director. Yeah. So he's in the, he has his hands in every committee you can imagine. He loves the rules because he he'll, he'll tell rules. you guys about the rules. <laughs> yeah, we love the so, rules. Um, and he's got his hands full though on, with everything coming down from the NCAA president in the last week too, yeah. on what his vision is yeah. of these subdivisions, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how maybe Craig and uh, the president of the NCAA meet here at that convention yeah. shortly and kind of like, what is this all about? And Explain it to me better. Right. You know, it was kind of um, awesome yet frustrating during Craig Bull's tenure, in my opinion, uh, because I was a fan for the first part of his tenure um, covering other teams outside of the state. He, man, he would just kick dudes off like no problem, like no second questions, no nothing. He even did the same with Willie Matt Garza, a, a coach on his staff when he got a DUI. It wasn't, you know, issue an apology, do some community service. It was, sorry, Willie, you got to go. And um, he did that with players. I mean, Javari Jackson comes to mind. Uh, Johanna Gaffon comes to mind. Uh, those guys were gone well before the uh, – well, especially in Gaffon's case, well before a uh, <laughs> an investigation was yeah. complete. And from all accounts, Gaffon was one of the best defensive tackles this university has probably ever seen. Yep. Uh, he didn't put up with anything. However, no nonsense. However, did hear toward the end of his career, you know, you can see in the police reports, they're readily available to anyone. I didn't feel like it was worth writing a story, but there were a couple of players that – Got misdemeanor charges for marijuana, stuff like that, that remained on the team. And I think he handled it internally. But uh, I think early Craig Bull might have said, oh, busted for anything? And, See fo- ya. and folks, don't text Cody and ask him who it was. Yeah. If you really want to know, look for yourself. <laughs> yeah. I had to look. You're going to look too, damn it. Um, but, yeah, overall, I, I just think he was a – he was a – just a, a football man and a really good coach. And it was really cool. I never in my lifetime thought that we would see a coach be here for 10 years. Um, never saw that coming because my whole life was coming and going with, with head coaches and maybe Teller would have stayed for a long time. Uh, Berman mentioned that at the press conference that, you know, Wyoming just for some reason never fully got behind Joe Tiller. Well, and what really came down to that too is Lee Moon didn't respect Joe Tiller. Yeah. And Joe, all he asked for was not a raise for himself, but a raise for the assistant pool. Yeah. Lee wouldn't give it to him. That's insane. Yep. 
So happy for Joe and what he ended up doing too. But Berman, you know, was obviously born in Laramie or raised in Laramie. He uh, he talked. He compared him to Paul Roach, Greg Bull. That is compared him to Paul Roach. Uh, probably that steadying older gentleman hand he had on the program, and uh, and Joe Tiller, who was just uh, should have been beloved but wasn't. Um, and Craig, I think, was more beloved. I, I really do. I think the entire west west side of the War Memorial Stadium. Uh, probably shed a tear last Wednesday about this time. Um, but it's um, – I, I, I definitely – I'm going to miss him. I, I don't know. I, I hope he stays in touch. Uh, he keeps – he would always say, like, one day we're going to have to get a Pendleton and, and talk. So I hope that day comes before he leaves Laramie because I would love to sit down and just hear him open up for a couple hours. It would be a beautiful It'd thing. It would be fun. He should take you guys out. It would be awesome. Or just invite you over to his house. Yeah, to have one of his famous steaks in Manhattan's. Yeah. I'd even smoke a cigar, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Question. Yeah. Hall of Fame worthy. Yes, because of... Wyoming Athletics Hall of Fame worthy. Yeah. Ten years. Longest tenured ever. The reason there are so many new buildings and infrastructure. um, Steadying hand. Big wins. Missouri, Texas Tech, Boise State, one championship appearance. I, I mean, there's an argument the other way as well, I guess, but I don't see how you leave Craig Ball out, all the NFL guys. And one of the things I was going to say about his, what we should really remember about Craig Bull is, unlike so many of the guys before him, he valued Wyoming and valued Wyoming players. Whether they came in as a walk-on or not, he, he proudly stood behind that podium last year just losing – uh, Luke Talich to Notre Dame, by the way, as a walk-on. And he was like, we have never missed on a local kid, ever. They didn't miss on Talich. They offered him. Mm-hmm. But I think that was more geared toward the kid in Sheridan, the the Coon kid, Colson Coon, who ended up walking on at Montana State or whatever. He said, if there's a guy worthy of playing for the Wyoming Cowboys, we haven't missed him. And he was pretty damn true about that, and he was pretty accurate. Yeah, I, I just don't think overall that he is University of Wyoming Hall of Fame worthy, but he's college football Hall of yeah, Fame Yeah, that's what I thought you were saying at first. No, yeah, yeah, because of what he did at you know, winning three national championships, that's you're going to get in. And Natty's as a, an assistant yep. at Nebraska. Yep. Yeah. Oh, he's in for sure. You don't think he'll be in U-dubs? Uh, Keep in mind who the voters are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's supposed to be 10 years down the road. They would probably make a provision for him to put him in, in within five if they do it. Um, I don't think he's worthy. But you also don't think Josh Allen's worthy, right? Uh, not not according to what the bylaws say, no. Yeah. They, and I'm sure that he will get in based on they, they will adjust the verbiage type of a deal, but not, not what he did on the field, no. Absolutely not. And he shouldn't have been on the top 25. Uh, Mountain West offensive team either. Yeah, for what he didn't do over oh, Brett Smith. Yeah, I yeah, mean that's insane. His look at his stats, you guys. He's not. He was never more than higher than third team, right? Offense. Yeah, I mean, just the bylaws don't allow that. Um, you have to be all conference for two years. <laughs> Boy, you are spouting an unpopular opinion right now, but it's not an opinion. It's based in what they the guidelines but, are. For what he did for the University of Wyoming? Likely more than anybody ever. Ever. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Is Hall of Fame worthy? In the, but I think he should go in in, in a special category. Sure. Special achievement category, not football category. Hopefully we can go into the Wyoming Hall of Fame together, Josh. <laughs> is Cody Tucker eligible for the uh, Wyoming Hall of Fame, Jared? Yes. <laughs> special <laughs> achievement. Will he make it into the Hall of No, I'm just kidding. You know whose 10 years is up, though? Is Brett Smith. His last year was in 2013. Wow. About that time, man. And boy, there's nobody more deserving. And I hate that his legacy is that he left here early. We all know that was a, eventually a mistake. But can you blame a kid for going on and trying to live his dream? I would not guess wanting there's, to start over? There's going to be some other football players that go in before him. But he'll definitely get in at some point. Because- yeah. His numbers speak for themselves. In three years, yeah. I mean, the guys he's one of my favorites yep. of all time. Uh, I guess a little more on Jay Savell. Um, yeah, like you said, the big question, how's this going to go? Um, I think we're all pretty confident defensively it's going to go just fine. He did say he will hire a defensive coordinator and he will not be meddling. Um, I think he's very much going to take the CEO approach. 
I think he'll be in the defensive meetings more than he will be in the offensive meetings. Yeah, or or Linda's suggestions yep. more so. Um, I I I kind of didn't love Craig Bowl having that CEO approach, but I kind of love Jay Savell doing it because what Jay has that Craig maybe fell short in is the relationship category. And you made a you just made a good mention about hiring a defensive coordinator. So what we've heard is that some of the money that they're not paying Jay compared to what Craig was making. There's going to be more of a pool of money available for assistant coaches. So that means yes, hire that defensive coordinator on top of what Jay's getting paid and most likely a special teams coordinator. How about a quarterback coach? Amen. Are there, I mean, I haven't done any research on this. I must admit, are there quarterback coaches at bigger programs? alongside the OC or are they all the same? Um, I bet you there's some that are both, uh, you know, that OC and quarterback coach. And then there's the OC might be handling, maybe he's the running backs coach. Oh. And then there's a quarterbacks coach that um, takes care of the passing game. And then the OC takes care of the running game, you know, something like that yeah. on planning. Well, you know, Savell's thought about this. He's definitely not mentioning anything public right now, but who stays on this staff? Um, They obviously need a new defensive coordinator, but does Tim Polisek go back to Fargo with an opening there and what he did with Carson Wentz and guys like that Mm -hmm. in Fargo? Um, And, you know, that the timing of this bowl game is actually really good for coaches to stay on Mm -hmm. because the convention's the following week. So... You know that they'll 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 they're all going to stay on, unless they get some unbelievable offer. I mean, yeah. even guys that are that have said they're going somewhere else are staying on until their bowl game, or their um, championship game, yeah. or semifinals are done. So, uh, but I I bet you there's probably going to be. I'm just going to throw it out there. Over unders two, which would be huge for a Craig Bowl staff. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, if you think about it, that's another thing you have to think about with him, good or bad, is he he held on to dudes. I mean, but then you talk to a guy like Frank Crum, and he's like, I played for six offensive line coaches. Yeah. But when you're the offensive line coach at Wyoming, you're going to get a look. Uh, to me, when you talk about the most valuable guys to hang on to, uh, I got to start with Gordy Haug, um, not only the running back coach, but really the record, recruiting coordinator. Obviously, he's done a bang up job. He's been Bull's right hand man he needs for to get a long rid of his time. Hat, though. <laughs> he's, I mean, he's young, up and coming. He really relates to players. He's done a, nobody can say that guy hasn't done a fantastic job. Agree and, with uh, you there. And then I would say Oscar Giles. Um, what he's brought to this program has been worth its weight in gold. I mean, he has so many hats he wears, and maybe the most important, aside from recruiting the state of Texas, is being a freshman head coach. And, of course, there's not freshman teams like there were back in the day, but living in the dorms with the freshmen and being that voice. and being the hang relationship. Yeah, being yep. the guy who you can come to and not get screamed at or, you know, he, he can be like a big brother type or mm-hmm. an uncle. I agree with you there. And, obviously, Brian Hendricks. Yep. Very important recruiting-wise. I mean, yep. former player at Wyoming, but Colorado recruiter. And uh, he has other territories as well, but really concentrating down there. And um, I'll go uh, um, trying to think of the other – oh, Aaron Bull. Yeah. I mean, who can argue with what he's done with linebackers? Yeah. Now, is it a gift? Yeah, I mean – A little bit of, the, of both. A little bit of both, but he's still coaching them up. He also was raised under in Craig Bull's household, and Craig made his mark as a defensive coach. I wonder how tough he was as a dad. I imagine he – but I can't imagine. But he Aaron. wasn't around a lot. Either. Right, right. And I don't imagine Aaron being the type of cat to really step out of line all that often. He's a pretty <laughs> mellow cat. But uh, I did ask Aaron off the record. Um, you know, I said, "Hey, congrats to your dad. What an unbelievable career. I hope you're sticking around." And he just said, "Yeah, thanks. I'm really proud of him." And I'm like, "I, I really hope you're sticking around." Don't know. I, I don't know. And maybe they don't know. Yeah. Um, is anybody on this team on this staff? ready to slide up and be a DC. You and I talked about it kind of like right after the press conference. And I mean, you have to have a knack for calling plays Mm -hmm. and game planning, not saying that they've, they're not all in the game planning meetings, but calling those plays as they're happening on the field, 
seeing things on the field to know what what's coming or projecting what's coming. Sometimes you get beat, and other times you call it perfectly. We we all know that on play to play, but I don't know if there's somebody on the staff that could handle that. I don't know either, but I do know Aaron Bull's been under Jay Savell for four years, and he's been under his father for thirty years. So you would think, you know, he's learned some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that would be weird, though, is uh, Aaron Bull coaches from the press box. I'd imagine moving down to the field could be a whole new, not to mention calling plays, could be you a whole new You don't see a lot of coordinators, though, on the field. Yeah, Jay loved it. But you know who who was down there well? It was Mike Bresky under the Joe Glenn era. Yeah. He called the defense from down there. And Mike Bresky was one of the better defense coordinators I think, around, too. I think Jay actually told me he, he you know, I want to talk to these guys. I want to have face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact with them if things aren't going right or if, you know, whatever. You just made a good point, though, because if Aaron's the one that's in the booth telling him what he's seeing from high above, because Jay can't see that same stuff from high above, maybe he is ready. Yeah. I don't know. It'll be interesting. And then Oscar Giles, I mean, he's been in this game a long, long, long time. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he just seems so content with what he's doing right now. I mean, just... He obviously is, even has his hands in on special teams. I mean, that guy wears so many hats. It, pay it's incredible. That man. Yeah, pay funny. him. Pay him. Yeah, Wyoming has done wonders in the state of Texas. Another big question that I thought of, you know, a million things went through my head the minute I got that email about Craig, uh, which, by the way, bravo to the University of Wyoming. They kept that one tight. <laughs> Not a lot of people knew that was going to happen. Um, are these recruiting? Uh, my first thought is this is, man, recruiting. Signing days in like two weeks. Uh, was this the time to call it, or do you sucker them and wait till they're signed on the dotted line, then you quit? I Quit's think they the wrong did. Word. By the way, retire. I think they did it right because in you're you're being honest with the players too. Yeah. Then they're like, you know what? Sometimes you do go to a place because of the head coach, but you're not around the head coach as much as you are your your position or, yeah. coaches. Yeah. Or your uh, strength coach. So they have better relationships with those guys than they do the head coach. Yeah, and I'm thinking they didn't tell, they didn't spill the beans to these guys either because I've I've interviewed a handful of these incoming recruits and you would, they, I'd be like, you know, what, what do you think it's going to be like to play for Craig Bowl? And you would think an 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid would go, oh, he's he's retiring. Uh, you didn't hear? Yeah, none of that was even yeah. kind of leaked. So... Uh, Jay Savell did say they had 18 at the time. They've added a 19th since Spencer Rathman, son of uh, Rob Rathman, uh, former awesome center for the nine, late 90s Cowboys. I loved Rob's uh, tweet about it, too. He yeah. was going to bring back some nastiness from 96. Yeah, hell yes. Yeah. <laughs> that that offensive line was nasty. Yes, they were. And his son, too, just got an offer, I believe, from Utah right before that. So I was kind of thinking, oh, God, like don't want to see that. I was texting back and forth with Rob, and it was – Rob said that Spencer was waiting for that day. That's awesome. His entire life. That's. I saw a picture of him as a kid with Brian Hill. Yeah. Like that's uh, that's good stuff. And uh, he he put in his little message uh, to the fans that um, I look forward to building on what Craig Bull did over this last decade and working with Jay Savell and Brian Hendricks and um, good stuff. And you can tell he's a fan. He and wouldn't Wyoming have. needs more legacy players. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of guys. That have gone elsewhere. Yep. And yep. some of it was for academic reasons. Um, you know, Reggie Slater's two kids, one went to Northwestern, <laughs> yeah. one went to Air Force. Can't yeah. argue with it, really. Yeah. Um, Tyrone Williams had two or three sons. One's at Montana State. One played at Washington. Uh, Washington. One played at uh, CSU Pueblo. Yeah. All really good players. Yeah. Um, and some of it is they don't they get overlooked. And some, sometimes you, you don't know if, they're doing their due diligence on making sure that these coaches know that, hey, I played there. Yeah. You know, type of a deal. I, my kid wants to go there. Right. And, you know, of course, Nick Talich is one that's the legacy player, but Wyoming needs more of them. Yeah. I did see Wynell Selden, great running back under Joe Glenn. He, uh, his son's tearing it up in the Metroplex as we speak and just received a, about three months ago, received a, um, how does he have a son that old? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know. I thought, damn, I'm getting old. Um, 
He has a son who just got offered by Marshall, which I would assume had something to do with Javon Bonite at the time, who now he is no longer at Marshall. Uh, but I, I wondered, you know, hey, that's a former teammate, and he's looking. I've heard another talking. one in the Metroplex area, too, is Will Holland, who played um, wide receiver in the mid-'90s. His son is only a freshman, apparently, but he is, like, tearing it up, one of the top running backs in the state of Texas. Yeah. If you're the top anything in the state of Texas, you're you're pretty good. Um, You know, something that we saw the fans – oh, speaking of, by the way, uh, Jay's contract terms, it looks like it's about five years, which is pretty standard these days, five years – Five point eight million dollar deal. I believe it's three hundred thousand guarantee or eight hundred thousand a year guaranteed. Three hundred thousand um, incentives on top of that, guaranteed, and then plus other dangling carrots like Craig Bull had the hundred. I don't know. I haven't looked at. I haven't looked at the full thing yet. I just got it in my email about five minutes ago. But uh, I like incentive based contracts. Oh, I do too. I do too. And and they're going to be able to use a lot of that extra money on other football related activities. Beat a P five team. Get paid for it. Yeah. Here's the question, though. They beat Washington State or Oregon State next year. Is Jay Savell knocking on Berman's door going, is that a P5 win? I bet you that's defined in that. <laughs> it better I bet be. You it's defined. It better be. Yep. I was thinking that right off the bat. Like, is that really going to be a P5 win? Um, the big thing people are talking about, however, Jared, is um, that moved really quick. And I think some people wanted the search firm and wanted that kind of stuff. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I like how it happened, to be honest with you. Search firms, in my opinion, are all about keeping it, things a secret. And a lot of the times it's used as leverage for those coaches and those agents at their current places. They have no intent on moving. They're using it as leverage to get paid more where they're at. So um, I'm fine with how it went, to be honest with you. No. Um, I thought Tom and staff did a great job on like you said, keeping it a secret. Yeah, they really and did. And then, um, then getting it done. Uh, I'm obviously time will tell, but I I feel good uh, going into next year. Somebody actually asked me yesterday, "Well, what do you think the record's going to be next year?" I'm like, "Well, <laughs> I mean, first of all, we don't even know what Mountain West team is getting replaced by Washington State or Oregon State." But at the same time, I just threw it out there, said eight and four again. Tough schedule next year. Yeah. Really I mean, tough schedule. At ASU, hosting BYU at North Texas. One of the Washington State or Oregon State. Yeah. Um, I don't think Wyoming would be lucky enough to lose Boise State off their schedule for one of those, so you could probably say Boise State. It'll probably be UNLV or Nevada that doesn't get replaced. <laughs> of course. They're, they're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most likely. CSU and Air Force are protected, of course. And so. hopefully Air Force is in November. Yeah. Uh, for lack of a better term, um, most ADs, their balls would be on the bandsaw with a hire like this if it doesn't go well. Is that one where, say, I hate to even say this, but say it turns out Vic Koning ish Is that kind of a straw that broke the camel's back for an AD? Definitely. And I'm not saying Ber- Berman's done a great job in so many but else, ways. But Tom's getting to the point where he's he's looking at retirement down the road too. True. You true. know, I mean, he's had, I don't know if he's had opportunities to go elsewhere. I know he's looked elsewhere a couple of times. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, his name was mentioned as possibly the Mountain West Commissioner replacement. Yeah. When Gloria got the job. Not, I don't know what, if he was actually out there, his name was mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but... And he does the bowl committee things. And he's all done that. with that. Yeah. Uh, he's off that term. But, yeah, he. I mean, he's negotiated a lot of TV contracts on behalf of the Mountain West Conference. Um, I could see him, say, five years down the road, Tom might be retiring himself, and uh, and he moves into one of those consultant roles, as a lot of retired ADs do. Yeah. He seemed awfully confident with this hire. Um, well, you have to be. Sure. Yeah, you do. Um but and he's he's betting on the come. Yeah, and I and I love that I I've always respected and loved Tom Berman's transparency. Um he could have said no, it doesn't bother me that he hasn't been a head coach. Uh yeah, hell yeah, it bothers me. Um cuz it bothers I think it bothers everyone a little bit. I mean, cuz it's just the fear of the unknown. He's sure Savell's coached under a lot of great coaches and he's seen what Craig Bull how Craig Bull operates for 4 years, but you don't really want to clone of Craig Bowles, do you? 
No. You, you, but I think a few questions that were presented to Jay, he kind of said, well, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. You know, type of a deal. So, like, I think you said it great off the air about he doesn't want to say something in front of Craig <laughs> to it, undermine yeah. what he has done yeah. or what he's still doing up until the bowl game. I think you'll see some new things, some new wrinkles, yeah. uh, you know, as things are out there. Uh, maybe maybe it's a totally different spring practice schedule. Who knows? Maybe they're going to practice at 6 a.m. Maybe we, maybe we can watch practice. Thank you. I was just <laughs> going to say that. And, you know, maybe there's going to be names on the back of the jerseys. Who knows? Yeah. You know, just those type of things. But And we both talked about we hope the scheme – and the design of the jerseys really don't change much. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, the other big question, too, is, and I wanted to ask this, but I just didn't feel like it was appropriate at the time. Um, what kind of offense are you going to run? Is it going to be drastically different? Um, he just said, I want to get the explosive players the ball. And to be explosive on offense, you have to get explosive players the ball. I think we can all agree, Ayer Asante, should have had about quadruple the touches in the attempts he's had this year. Just like when Nair was here. Just like when Nair was here. Yeah. So many more opportunities to catch yeah. balls. With that being said, too, Nair's back in the transfer portal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does he come back? Did he love Jay Savell enough to come back? Or if there's a new, different, uh, you know, a different um, offensive coordinator. Yeah. If Tim does leave and go somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, he goes, like, hmm, they're going to pass the ball that much more? And Sabota's got that big of an arm? All right. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't know. And speaking of the transfer portal, the Cowboys only have four guys currently in the portal. Um, it still amazes me, Jared, even though it shouldn't, how many people jump off a cliff when anybody goes in the transfer portal. A lot of talking without thinking. A lot of see you, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. Um, you people, and you know who I'm talking about, are absolutely ridiculous. Um, instead of tweeting or writing on Facebook, just when you think about doing that, just don't. Um, and then you double down with your idiocy, and it's just – it's so hard to deal with for me, Jared. You know personally I it makes me want to snap. But uh, Keelan Cox is entering the transfer portal, edge rusher from Alabama who never played. Hadn't played one minute, one down. Not one. And he even posted that I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted to, and and I know he does because I just interviewed the guy. He absolutely was fine. I said, you know, are you down right now because you're not getting on the field? And he's like, man, when I'm ready, when they think I'm ready, I'll be ready. And I said, why do you have such a positive attitude? He said, hell, I grew up in a single parent home. It could be a hell of a lot worse than this. Um, I'm happy. I'm really happy. And they, he actually pulled out a piece of paper and he goes, this is what the coaches just showed me. Um, cause I even wondered with COVID and everything, how many years I have left and, and last year ended up being a red shirt or a medical red shirt. So he's like, man, I have till 2026. I have time, man. I'm going to be all right. And, uh, he wanted to be here. So don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. Um, obviously he was told he was not going to be in the future plans, right? That's it. And, and the coaches want to do what's right for the majority of these players. Yeah. And they want to help find them a place where they can get on the field. And why would you wait until the bowl game when it's on the 30th of December when the transfer portal closes on the 2nd? These are the guys that you need to get moving to and find a place. And especially if they know they're not they're not going to play in the bowl game, they're only going to be a practice player leading up to it. Yeah. That's I'm I'm fine with it too. And and then the walk-on linebacker from Missouri. Yeah. He hadn't played a down, you guys. Not I one. Mean, and then we already knew about uh Taylor yeah. And DQ, DQ was a long time ago, and we could see the writing on the wall with Taylor. Yeah, and he announced he's going to Vanderbilt. Yeah, well, good luck with the SEC speed if you can't even cover some of the guys in the Mountain West. He's not only going to Vanderbilt, Jared. He's going to the University of Vanderbilt. Yeah, that, I I <laughs> see those announcements too, and it's like, do do a little bit of homework. Yeah, I mean, you see it with I've some seen guys. Wyoming University. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that means. Well, I guess they're coming to play football. <laughs> yep. <laughs> even in, even at Vandy, he's not coming to be a doctor. Brady Holdman is the Missouri kid you're talking about. He is a walk-on linebacker from Missouri. So it doesn't really even count as somebody entering the transfer portal God. if they are a walk-on. None of these really do. They And they have to announce it 
or go through the portal, even they, though they are a walk-on. Yeah. Same as Nathaniel Talich. Yes. He had to announce it that way and say he was going to the portal for some NCAA purpose. Yeah, and to land at Casper College. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we knew about DQ James. He was obviously kicked off the team in September. Colby Taylor was benched from UNLV on. Uh, we knew that was going south. And what's funny is uh, somebody in the program told me before the season started, uh, they said Colby Taylor is so good. He is so athletic and he's so talented. Because um, I asked, how good can this guy be? They said, he'll be in the transfer portal at the end of the year. And I'm like, Wow. They're like, yeah. I was like, you going to do anything to try and keep him? Well, of course, but, I mean, he is that talented. They are going to grab him up in a heartbeat. Uh, he indeed landed in the transfer portal, but not for the reasons that uh, this gentleman thought. Um, Keelan Cox, best of wishes to him, man. He's one of my favorite guys I ever covered. He is a fantastic human being, and uh, I hope only the best for that guy. All these dudes. Uh, DQ was always great to me. Colby was good to me. Brady Holtman, I never met. Uh, he was a walk-on, you know. He, he he just they were excited about him. I remember they were excited about him, but it's just it is what it is, man. There is no reason to jump off a cliff right now. The Wyoming Cowboys are doing fantastic in the transfer portal. Uh, they haven't got anybody yet. That's the only concern, and that's another thing with Jay Savell. How active is he going to be in the portal compared to Craig Bull? Um, is he going to want to supplement some more guys from the portal? Uh, than Craig. I don't know. Uh, Craig definitely was always going to go with that high school model. He was not getting away from that anytime soon. He was just going to supplement with some of these dudes. I did see that they offered a wide receiver from Arkansas Pine Bluffs. Didn't look into him much, but I assume he's an I.E. or Santi type. One year left. And if he plays at Pine Bluffs, you know, they because they go up and down the field. Yeah. Yep. So he probably it's probably an Asante type, and uh, that's what they're looking for. And we've talked about it a hundred times on here, Jared, that I think you supplement at wide receiver left and right. To me, going into next season, thinking about it right now, that wide receiver position is a skeleton crew of dudes we don't know anything about. Jalen Sargent, Caleb Merritt, those guys have caught a few balls. Just put the entire tight end um, <laughs> room out there. <laughs> yeah. and line them up at wide out, tight end, slot. And John Michael Gillenborgs is so good, he could play wide receiver. You saw his speed. I mean, he's big, he's strong, he looks like baby Gronk right now. So that's a guy you do not want to lose to the portal. But the, I, I didn't envision the portal being busy anyway. Um, we we talk about this kind of stuff in the press box all the time. I, I know Thor, Ryan Thorburn and I have looked down on the field at the same time and went, who do you really see leaving? Plus they have, what, 18, 19 guys leaving as seniors or, or leaving or ending their career? That's a lot of open starting positions up for grabs. And if there's a couple of these guys that – were announced on senior day that still have a year of eligibility left, and if they end up somewhere else, don't get mad at them, you guys. They're graduating. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, who cares? And who knows? Some of them might come back because Savell's a guy. True. Uh, who knows? Maybe 28? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, Friday we will uh, get to talk to uh, – we're going back to normal, I guess, on Friday. So we're going to get to talk to – Bowl and players, and maybe talk about Toledo, who Wyoming's playing in the uh, Arizona Bowl. <laughs> Did you even remember that? No, I had to think about <laughs> yeah. it. But that line has changed from being dogged two and a half points. Now Wyoming's a three point favorite because of a lot of it's because of Toledo's yeah. uh, transfers, of course. But all some of it too is Wyoming's playing for Craig Bowl's last game. And that that swung that day one full point yeah. on that announcement. And um, so if, if you bet the money line when Wyoming was dogged by two and a half, and it was about uh, plus 110 on the odds, if you bet the money line for Wyoming to win that game outright, uh, you can now make money on your bet if you cash out right now and then re-bet. But you'd have to rebet as Wyoming as a favorite, of course. Hmm. But it, it, it's pretty interesting. You can make money right now without even the game being played. Does Craig Bull get carried off the field in Tucson if they win? I just hope they dump uh, dump water on him and that's it. <laughs> I'd kind of like to see him get carried out. Joe Tiller style in 93? Maybe a few more guys in on it to help. <laughs> <laughs> Only two guys. I think, well, they were offensive linemen, though. They could yeah, handle it. Yeah, yeah. Those big, huge pads they had back yeah, then. True. It's probably just like sitting in the chair. He could have just sat on their neck, roll on their back like a little kid. So. I don't know. It's it, What a career. What a career for Craig Bowl. I'm really happy for him and his future endeavors. Um, 
We've been asking him since Mountain West Media Days if this was it. Uh, one year left on the contract, something had to give. We knew something had to give, and by all accounts, I, I've had a lot of questions saying, do you think he was forced out? No, no, no. Tom Berman would have re-upped him in two jiggles of a jackrabbit's ass. If he asked for an extension, Tom would have gave it to him more, more than likely. Yes. And there would have been provisions in it, though, saying you're not paid out for the end of your contract. It's it's a one year deal, but yeah. you have five five years on your contract. If they would have gave him a five year deal, I think people's heads would have exploded. But if they have to understand For, yes. what it is. Yeah. Good luck with that too. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, <laughs> dealing with our fans. <laughs> that takes reading. Um cool. real quick, basketball wise, uh Cowboys uh, big win over Stephen F. Austin. Uh what day was that? Saturday. Uh, that was the most boring first half of basketball I think I've ever witnessed, and that's saying something because I've seen a ton of horrendous basketball. Uh, the teddy bear toss and the infant crawl at halftime were by far the highlights of that first half. Cowboys found themselves in a 10-point hole with 13 to go, 12, 12-something to go, and they got it going, man. They played really well down the stretch, took over. You could tell uh, the lumberjacks were – they had their hands over their heads. They were tugging on their shorts. They were exhausted. And some of it they did to themselves because they were going into a soft press. And yes. Like, Just go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They ran themselves right out of gas. Cowboys took full advantage. Luckily for the Cowboys, uh, Stephen F. Austin was in the giving spirit just like they've been all year. 20 turnovers each. 46 whistles in this game. Misery. That is what I hate about basketball in a nutshell. It is so unwatchable when there's whistle after whistle after whistle. It's almost like the complaining that's going on with NFL officiating this entire season, and let alone this last weekend. Yeah. I mean, college basketball officiating, and it's I think it's at all levels. Because you see every year high school, there's a lack of high school officials. Yeah. They need more people to learn the trade. And I think it's getting to that way in college. They're not getting paid enough to where they – can do that as a full-time job. Yeah. NFL officials don't even do that as a full-time job. That's crazy. But it's going to have to get to that point. And uh, the national media call it about protecting the shield. Yeah. And that's what the NFL needs to do. Yeah. <clears throat> I've watched about 45 seconds. I, I usually watch about 45 seconds NBA basketball a year. Um, and I see egregious fouls the, and the whistle's not even blown. And it's like, we should go to that. <laughs> I hate it, but they travel all the time, and it's a nightmare. But the whistle isn't blowing. Guys aren't spending the entire game at the you foul mean that line. one L.A. Laker? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. one guy. Yeah. He, he does it the most. Yeah, the L.A. step. I think they call it the five step. Uh, so, yeah, pokes off to a you know, six and three start basketball-wise. And, and um, won nine last year. And, uh, <laughs> Good start. They do have a tough game this coming Saturday, Weber State. Yeah. Weber plays at Nevada tonight. So we'll see. That's kind of the telling tale on what – you'll probably see on Saturday. Yeah. So if you get a chance to tune in to that this evening, uh, take a look at that because Nevada's playing pretty good basketball right now. Well, and I know I dumped on that first half, but really that, Wyoming's backcourt's fun to watch and Cam Manio's a uh, really good player. Um, you go to the double-A and you're going to get entertained. They, they, they eventually step on the gas. They got some shooters. They do. It's so nice to see. And but they have got to cut down on those turnovers. I want to say I did the math during the game. I want to say it was 128 turnovers through their first seven games. Plus 20. Plus 20 more. I mean, that, that is not an average that you want, folks. No. it. I haven't looked it up, but it's got to be the worst in college basketball. Or damn One near. of the worst, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so that that's the downside that's going on right now. But And it was funny how you, you guys asked Linder, did you uh, chip some paint yeah. in the halftime? <laughs> no, I didn't say one four-letter word. Yep. <laughs> sure you didn't. Sure you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he isn't. <laughs> His mannerisms on the sideline haven't changed a whole lot as far as throwing his arms up in the air, flailing his shoulders around, those kind of things. I don't think he's yelling as much or probably dropping F-bombs as much on the sideline. So maybe he's a little bit controlled. But he's still, you can see his his body language is still like, oh, geez. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? It's like, you can't do that. They, they're watching you. I think we all dropped an F-bomb in the press box when Oleg Kojenitz had a wide-open lane and nobody even looking at him and couldn't uh, complete a dunk. 
uh, and missed at the rim. And it was just that's when things were going really bad in that game, too. And it was just like, what are we doing here? Well, and, and the inside game is going to change once Mason comes yes, back. Yes, it is. Um, and we don't know when that's going to be. It could Sooner be rather than later. two weeks. It could be three weeks. It might be next week. It might Who be knows? Saturday. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, he hurt his off hand, and he's been able to still run and stuff during this. So his conditioning's still good. And does he start? Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe, maybe do they run three big guys in the two guards? Yeah. And then Wenzel's kind of that um, role player. Yeah. Six-man guy. Yeah. Because he, he's very good at doing that. He plays really good defense. Yeah. Great on the boards for a, a so-called guard. Yeah. Um, and he's kind of your all-around guy and senior. Hard hat, dude. Yeah. Yeah, he what an effort from him by the way on Saturday. Not to that's what my whole column was about. How what a what a game he had. He was tougher than nails. He was sick, and he played really well, taking charges, doing all the dirty stuff. So just go back to football real quick. On um, I know we talked about these when the season started about um, placing your future bets mm-hmm. on um, if you know the over unders on wins and stuff like that. We'll see who was right and who was wrong. Uh, Air Force ended up with eight wins. Um, everybody but one that I have on here, which was Circus Sports, had him at eight and a half. So if you took the over, lost money. Boy, did they Boise choke. State, uh, they ended up with eight wins. Uh, a couple of them had it at seven and a half. Others had it at eight and a half. So depending on who you used, mm-hmm. that's why I say you need to shop around on getting your best best odds on these. CSU, um, some people had them at five. Most of them were at four and a half. So they, they actually covered that yep. with their five wins. Uh, Fresno State, you lost money on. Everybody had them at eight and a half for the most part. Hawaii, you won money on. Everybody had them at three and a half, and they ended up with five wins. That's what I love about Hawaii coming back against CSU. There's a lot to love about that. But Wyoming didn't just piss pound a Hawaii team that mailed it in, like a Nevada team that mailed it in. Hawaii came back and they gave CSU everything they wanted in that last game and then won it on an unbelievable walk-off field goal. How many times have you heard piss pound? That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, New Mexico, four wins. Everybody had them at three or three and a half. Uh, San Diego State, hopefully, if anybody bet that feature, they took the under because you would have lost money on the over. Uh, San Jose State, everybody had them at five and a half, and they ended up with seven, which they rattled off six in a row. Yeah. So – that's great. Uh, UNLV crushed the over on those. Uh, Utah State was five and a half, five, so if took the over, you're there. And Wyoming, I told everybody in the beginning, take the over because it was five and a half or six and a half. And just would have crushed that one too. That would have came in two weeks, two that weeks to go. Saw way more wins than six on this schedule. I was one of them. Yeah. I, I didn't put a lot on it, but I won a little bit on it. There so. you go. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up here. Uh, Jared did an interview this week. Um, I'm going to see if I can. Clint Overby, he's a VP of ESPN Events, and he's got his hands in on. So ESPN owns and operates 17 bowls. I was way off. I thought it was 30. I did too. But um, it's it's 17 that actually ESPN Events oversees. They do a lot of basketball stuff too, but uh, he oversees a lot of that. And just talk to him about the bowl process, the bowl selection process, and and what his travels are going to be. So hopefully you guys enter, um, you know, uh, like the interview on this to, to learn more about what goes into um, to that bowl selection Sunday. Yeah, really interested to hear what Clint Overby has to say. Um, thank you for doing that, by the way. That's awesome. Um, I want to give a shout-out yeah. to a couple of our pickers back uh, during uh, Veterans Day weekend. Uh, we had a couple of Wyoming guys, uh, Griffin Casey, and um, Heath Harrow, I think I got that right, that name right there. They both in the in the armed forces, and they have ties to Wyoming. And they sent us a couple of Velcro patches from their units and some stickers. So we certainly appreciate that. And oh. uh, Griff, hopefully you received the goodie, the seventy two twenty goodies that we sent you as well. Yeah, this says Combined Air Operations Center Weather Specialty Team. And I know when I first got their email. It was like, said something about like working at the Pentagon or something. And I was like, who the hell are these guys? Am I on an FBI watch list? <laughs> well, I'm sure you are actually. So. <laughs> yeah, glad those guys could join us. And thank you so much for the stickers. That's really cool. And the, the patches are awesome. And thank all of our pickers. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of fun. Um, 
Uh, we will be getting back into it again next week with um, with bowl season. Actually, actually, it's this week. We need to get them going. <laughs> Sorry, because bowl games start on uh, Saturday. Yeah. So, but we took last week off. Uh, but we will get back into it this week, and we always appreciate it. And and if somebody does want to be a picker, uh, don't overload the inbox of uh, <laughs> Cody or me. But we do, of course, enjoy our um, our listeners and. Um, yeah viewers uh being a part of our guest pickers absolutely uh we'll come back next wednesday probably i might as well keep this a you want to keep this a wednesday thing yeah we'll do a holiday version next wednesday and then we'll probably do the wednesday after that for the the bowl preview yep. because uh we're both traveling down to tucson yep and uh next week we'll have some some hoops to talk about of course and also like i said friday uh, things are getting back to normal with the wyoming football team so uh, actually talk about Toledo maybe. Uh, I'm sure uh, the the retirement is still fully on these guys' minds. We haven't been able to talk to any players about their thoughts on it. Uh, How many Manhattans has oh. Craig had since last Wednesday? Oh, man. The over-under on that would be... Two a night times seven, so that's 14. <laughs> <laughs> and he might have doubled up because he's thinking, what did I just do? <laughs> I left how much money on the table? Pour another one. Uh, yeah, congrats again to Craig Bull. Uh, great career for him. Uh, excited to work with him these last few weeks. And uh, hopefully he'll uh, follow through with the Pendleton Pendleton meetup. That would be a lot of fun. So I know uh, Ryan Thorburn and Alex Taylor would love that as well. So maybe we can even get him in here. We'll just drink whiskey on the air and just tell Craig, once tell he, us everything. Once he... I guess I don't know if you have to be in Texas to be the AFCA president. Maybe he does have a house in Wyoming and a maybe an apartment down there or yeah. a house in both places. I don't know. But um, it would be good to have him in here sometime and do a do a happy hour version. That would be a lot of fun. Have a couple, and maybe he opens <laughs> up just a tad bit. Oh, we'll have more than a couple. We'll get him wide open. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, st- stay tuned to uh, Jared's interview with Clint, Clint Overby here from ESPN, and uh, we'll see you next week. Today we're joined by Clint Oberby, VP of Events at ESPN. And Clint, appreciate you being on with us today. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. Always enjoy uh, catching up. You bet. Um, can you explain your role to the audience of what you do um, for ESPN? So I'll give you the quick version because this could be a pretty long story. But but basically ESPN has a division called ESPN Events that owns and operates uh, 17 bowl games, 11 basketball events several early season football games and uh and a softball event and a gymnastics event and we create this content for the purposes of creating uh multi-tiered opportunities for uh the 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 intercollegiate playing community as well as creating viewership opportunities so it's both participatory for us as well as uh fan engagement so we look at it from from a couple different lenses but we've been in this business for 25 years uh, and, and really enjoy working in the college football postseason specifically. That's where we got our start, uh, but certainly enjoy the rest of it as well with basketball. We've had Wyoming basketball. We've had, obviously, your, your team, your, your football team in our bowl games as well. So uh, we, we've run the gamut through the years. And you said uh, 17 bowl games? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, for some reason, I thought it was more than that, uh, but um, – can you let us know what goes into the entire bowl selection process? It's it's not as cut and dry as it once was when the second place team went to bowl X and the third place team automatically went to bowl Z. So what what goes into the process? Yeah, years ago, Jared, to your point, you know, it was it was a pretty stratified you know process where to your, you know to what you said, it would you know this this bowl would have its selection based on record and based on selection criteria. It would it would take this game and it was ranked right. Well, you know, at some point in time, you know, that created either, a, you know, multiple trips by one team to a particular bowl or it didn't take into account geography or other factors. So uh, what what started happening, especially at the group of five level, is is taking the games and pooling them in a way where you could create some unique matchups and create some some different opportunities. So our approach with our conferences, our partner conferences, and certainly with the games that we own, is to be very collaborative with our, our conference partners so we can create, uh, again, unique opportunities, take teams to where they want to be. You know, we don't always get it right. I'm, I'll be candid with you. Sometimes things don't don't always work out the way we anticipate because, you know, certain teams don't get eligible, certain do. I mean, it just, just depends. Uh, but the process is incredibly collaborative. It goes. It takes place over several weeks. I start calls with the conferences 
typically in October, you know, just to kind of set the stage. And then it evolves over the course of four or five weeks, you know, with, uh, you know, with the last week of, of November really helping set the number of teams that will be bowl eligible. And then, of course, championship Saturday really, you know, in, in the first first Saturday in December really sets where everybody goes. Um, but it's 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 a it's a fairly lengthy process. Um, with that being said, how close was Wyoming being selected to either the Frisco Bowl or the Guaranteed Rate Bowl in Phoenix? Well, I think, you know, not knowing what the Guaranteed Rate Bowl's process is or how they made the decision to take UNLV over Wyoming, not, you know, specifically, um, I, I think first and foremost, Wyoming has a great reputation from a bowl standpoint of being a very well-traveled, you know, program. Uh, players are always energized participate well coaching staff administration all of it is always very super engaged and of course your fans are are just wonderful so from from a standpoint of where teams want to you know where bowls want teams wyoming's always at the top of the list from from mountain west standpoint um in terms of you know arizona selection versus frisco it really came down to just where people could go um i know arizona or i'm sorry wyoming's been to arizona a couple times over the last several years um you know, the, the good news is it's a great experience. Um, and, and I think the Arizona Bowl folks will do a great job trying to mix it up so it doesn't feel like the same thing over and over for, for Wyoming fans and, and players. Uh, but it was it was one of those things where it just, it just didn't work out to have Wyoming to not go back to Arizona. And it's only something we're going to work on going forward in terms of making sure Wyoming uh, gets a great opportunity next year. And, and again, the postseason is a great opportunity any year. Um, so oh, I think, absolutely. Right. And I think, and again, you know, your, your AD is wonderful to work with. Tom's one of the best. So I know he, you know, I know he, he, he looks forward to these opportunities because he knows, you know, he knows how, how, how exclusive and important they are for your program. And how, how important is butts in the seats compared to what the, you know, the audience, the TV audience is going to be? Well, I think they go hand in hand, Jared. Right? I don't. I don't think you can completely divorce yourself from either one. Um, you know, I, certainly, certainly the TV part plays a big role in terms of you know the timing and the scheduling and all that. And there's no doubt about it. And it's maximized for ratings purposes, no doubt about it. But at the same time, the energy that's in the venue is what translates to on on air, and and we see it directly, right? <clears throat> if a if a person's flipping, and I guess no one flips through channels anymore like I do, but in the old days when you would flip through channels or I guess you'd go directly to streaming and you don't feel that energy that's translated by the crowd, people tend to tune out quickly. Um, so the, the, the importance of butts and seats is really important. Of course, it's really important for the economics of the game itself. Um, you know, the game has to survive somehow, you know, and, and these things are living, breathing businesses at the end of the day because – um, we are paying rights fees or bulls are paying rights fees. They are paying, you know, obviously fees for, um, you know, putting the game on, you know, there's an expense to all that. So um, all that has to be recovered somehow and ticketing is a part of it. But I think at the end of the day, it also demonstrates the health of a program and its relationship with its fan base when you have healthy fan support at these things. So or at these bowl games. So I think. I think they're very much, again, hand in hand. They need to go together. Um, and I think, again, Wyoming has demonstrated year over year that they, they support their team wherever they go. Um, with that being said, do you see the bowls for the Mountain West changing in the next year with the new scheduling alliance with Washington State and Oregon State? You know, I can't predict that right now. Jerry, I think we got to get through this year first before we start really seeing what the impacts of full realignment looks like. And I think you know, as we've been going through this for the last couple of years, no one anticipated the dissolvement of one full league. And, and so the absorption of that within the current bowl ecosystem will take a little bit of time to work out. So will it look different? I can't say that. Um, I think anecdotally you can certainly suggest that there's a possibility that there will be some, some modification of the bowl lineup, but I can't even begin to start to, to tell you what that's going to look like. Okay. What's your travel schedule look like with – um, out of the 17 bowls, how many do you hit? Um, I don't know so much hit games. I try to hit functions where I know I can see as many people as I can. So I'll try to hit between eight and nine bowl games in our lineup. Um, you know, hit various functions. I'll, I'll make a couple of games out of that. Um, but I find it's it's really important. One, I want to see 
Uh, I want to see our partners face to face. I enjoy that part of the job. Um, I also like being in our in our local communities where our people do a lot of great work putting these games on. So I like supporting their efforts as well. Um, so I I enjoy that part of the job. I think it's one of the best parts of what I get to do. Okay, good. Yeah, I think the last time we ran into one another was one of the New Mexico Bulls that That's right. was participating in. So That's right. Yeah. Well, certainly appreciate your time today and, um, you know, have a happy holiday season and um, bowl travel season. Certainly appreciate Thank you. you having on, being on with us today. Thank you, Jared, and good luck to you guys as you play uh, Toledo, all right? All right, appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Clint. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.